Hi, welcome to this week's sermon from Calvary Baptist Church in Lake Havasu. Today, we focus on the final fruit of the Spirit, self-control. The scripture we are studying is from Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. To follow along with the Life Notes, download them now from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, uh, we're looking at the same text we've been looking at for a while. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're at one of our campuses, uh, whether it's uh, at Sweetwater or at our Parker campus, and turn to page 1,158. That's page 1158. You'll be able to follow along, join with us. And as always, if you're at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, just take one. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, we would love to get you one. Just message your service host or email us at calvaryaz.com. We'll be glad to get you one because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, uh, speaking of campuses, uh, I just got to tell you guys that our North Campus is underway. It is officially uh, uh, merged. Yeah, we've officially merged with uh, what used to be uh, New Hope Church. And so we are uh, starting renovations this month. And, uh, and if you're just like bored sitting around in the heat and you want to tear some stuff up, uh, let, me, let us know. We'll be glad to, to connect you with those who are doing the work and uh, remaking that to, to look a, a little bit more uh, uh, Calvary style. So anyway, that's going on and I'm praising God for that. You know what else I'm praising God for? This morning, I had the privilege of participating in a baptism. Three people got baptized in a, in a pool. There was a party, there was a celebration. And, uh, and it is just always a delight when people declare their faith in Jesus. And so uh, we've got lake baptisms coming up. And if you have not declared to the world that you are an unashamed follower of Jesus and you want to do that, sign up for that. If you can't make that on September the 8th uh, and you want to get baptized, hey, we got a baptistry here. We're baptizing uh, at McCulloch this weekend. Uh, and it's going to be exciting. An 80-something-year-old lady who is saying, I want the world to know I'm a follower of Jesus. You know, God is good. And... Uh, and so if you want to be part of that celebration, that party, let us know. We'd be glad to help you follow Jesus anywhere there's water and witnesses. How's that? Okay. Hey, today we are concluding our fruit of the spirit emphasis, looking at the final and least favorite fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is, <laughs> we know, we know we've been dreading this sermon. I'm glad you guys are here. Thank you. For showing up. Uh, but Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, it's only been like 10 weeks that we've been encouraging you to learn this, to know this, to, to say this. And, and so if you know it, say it with me. If not, just fake it. Uh, the people around you can't tell. All right. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. In other words, this is the character of Jesus. And if we live it, we don't have to worry about the other stuff because we're going to be obeying God in our lives. So we're talking about self-control. And whether you're desiring self-control or desperately need self-control or you really haven't thought about it and don't want it, uh, God's word repeatedly commends self-control and condemns the lack of it. I mean, that, that's, it's, that covers both sides of it. Proverbs 25, 28 says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. A city broken into and left without walls. Now, again, when Proverbs was written, if you didn't have walls, you were exposed. You were defenseless and helpless. And, and, and Solomon says, look, if you're exposed like that, then that's what self-control, lack of self-control does to you. So self-control is what God wants to teach us to protect our lives from folly and self-destruction. Okay, do, do you get that? I mean, we, we're not real big on self, we're not, we're not excited about self-control. Self-control is like, oh yeah, I need that. But this is God trying to protect us from folly and self-destruction in our lives. Now, all the fruit are trying to protect us, trying to help us, but... Um, for the record, and I want you to hear this, and, and maybe if you don't hear anything else, hear this. You will either learn self-control or you will engage in self-destruction. Okay, you will either learn self-control or you will engage in self-destruction. 
Because every single follower of Jesus, every person who believes that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, who believes that he died on the cross to pay for their sins and was raised from the dead and has made a commitment to follow Jesus with their life, every single person who believes that is fighting the battle inside. Okay, we're fighting a battle inside. Galatians chapter 5, we've already looked at this, but we're going to look at it again. I want to read it one more time. Beginning at verse 16, the apostle says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Okay, so... There's a battle going on inside of us who are followers of Jesus. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, then, then this battle's not happening because you don't have the Holy Spirit in you who is trying to prompt you to practice self-control and follow Jesus. And so, you know, your life is probably a little bit more peaceful than those of us who are following Jesus because we have this battle going on inside of us. And by the way, if you thought you were the only one who was struggling with this battle on the inside, then think again. Every single person around you in this room is fighting the spiritual battle if they're a follower of Jesus. It is not unique to you. You're not the only one who has these evil thoughts. I hate to break that to you. You're not the worst sinner ever, okay? You're not the only one who, who has these impulses and these desires and, and all this kind of stuff. That's the battle that's inside of us. And God the Holy Spirit is calling you to life. Your flesh is encouraging you to, destru to destroy yourself. Okay, and, and, and you and I are gonna decide who wins the battle inside. Okay, God wants to bless you. Satan wants to curse you. Your redeemed nature, you know, this, this new life that's inside of you wants to follow Jesus. Your flesh wants to party with the devil. Okay, I don't care how saved you are. That's reality. Okay, I don't care how long you've been following Jesus. You are one choice away from indulging your sin nature again. That is why we need self-control. I mean, the Apostle Paul challenged his protege, Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, For you have not been given a spirit of fear, but one of power and love and self-control. Power and love and self-control. Instead of fear. Instead of living in fear. So uh, do you guys want to have power in your life? Okay, do you guys want to experience a lot of love in your life? Then you need self-control. <laughs> They, 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 they all go together. They're a package deal. By the way, uh, just in case you're wondering, self-control is really just the act of submitting to the Holy Spirit. Okay, self-control is saying, I'm gonna do what the Holy Spirit wants me to do instead of what I want to do. And so it's, you know, submit, submitting to his leadership, especially when we don't want to obey. Because there's times when you're like, yeah, I wanna obey God. And there's times when you're like, I don't wanna obey God. Okay, and we just have to be honest about that and, and say, hey, I, I, okay, I don't want to obey God, but self-control means I'm going to submit to the Holy Spirit and I'm going to obey God when I don't want to do that. And, and the Apostle Paul wants us to know as well that victory is achieved through preparation. Okay, so if we want to win this battle on the inside, we want self-control in our lives, then we have to prepare for the battle. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 the Apostle uh, Paul writes these words. And, and I, I want you to hear these. You can turn over there if you want to. It's page 1137, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 through 27. He says this, you, and, and this is fitting because it's Olympic season, right? He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? They didn't have gold, silver, and bronze back then. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul's like, look, I, I want to take this seriously. I want to win the race. I want to run well. I want to fight well. I want to win this battle inside. And so I have to prepare. I have to practice. He says, I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as like I'm just beating the air. I want to I win the fight. So let me just ask this. How many of you played sports at some point in your life? Okay, most hands. How many of you did like the organized stuff? Okay, like team sports? Okay, how many of you are good? See, I can't raise my hand on that. But you know, some of you are. All right, 
but I always wanted to win. So when, if you're playing on a, on a you know, football team, baseball team, basketball team, volleyball team, swim team, you know, cheer team, anything like that, did you just show up on game day? Did you just like show up and like, hey, I got my uniform, let's play? No, you practiced. In fact, you practiced way more than you played the game. Right? I mean, okay, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell on it. I didn't ask permission, so I might get in trouble. But uh, my youngest was in high school, so it was a long time ago. And, uh, and she's like, hey, I think I'm gonna go out for basketball. And I was like, great, I love basketball. That was my sport in high school. And, uh, and then she comes back the next day, and she goes, I'm not going out for basketball. And I go, why not? She goes, you know they practice every day? <laughs> Who wants to play basketball every day? And I went, I do. That's what you do. And so you practice. You know, you have the preseason and you do the practice. You know, and, and I remember over Christmas break running laps for basketball. Just like, you know, just why are we running? Because we want to run. And, and so we're just doing that. And, and it's like, I want to do this. I want to get good at this. I, I didn't, but I wanted to get good. And, and so, you know, you work at it and then you have the game. And then you work at it some more and a whole bunch more. And then you have another game. But you, you practice way more than you compete. And you do it so you can win, right? That's the goal. That's the goal. We want to win. And if you don't practice, you won't have success. So do you want to win the battle inside? Okay, good. Some of you do. The rest, eh. Okay, if we want to win the battle inside, we have to practice self-control. We have to practice submission and obedience to God. And if we don't practice obedience, if we don't practice self-control before the temptation comes, we won't be ready for the battle. And, the, and I'm just going to say this. One of the reasons we lose so many spiritual battles, so many, one of the reasons we lose so many of the battles inside is because we don't practice self-control. So let's talk about preparing for the battlegrounds. The battlegrounds. Uh, I want to discuss three common battlegrounds of self-control. Places that we all struggle to some extent. And my guess is that at least one of these is going to apply to you. Okay, maybe more. Uh, but what I want to do is I want you to listen and I want you to see if this is an area that you struggle in self-control. If this is one of your battlegrounds. So the first battleground I want to talk about is the battleground of indulgence. Indulgence. Many of the works of the flesh are about indulgence, addictions, drunkenness, sexual sin, gluttony, laziness, greed. You know, that, that desire inside of us that says, I want more. I want more. A little bit's not enough. I want more. We want to do what feels good and what pleases our flesh, our bodies. I mean, we live in these bodies and we know what they like and, and, and they like stuff that makes them feel good even if it's temporary and bad for us, even if it's self-destructive. And we're talking about whether this is uh, indulgence, indulging in our addictions to alcohol or drugs, whether it's indulging our lust through sexual immorality and pornography, whether it's indulging our appetite through gluttony, indulging our laziness through binge-watching Netflix or playing video games because you got to get one more level, right? Just another level. And, or just, you know, excessive play. And all of us, all of us are tempted to indulge in destructive habits. So one of my temptations and weaknesses is gluttony. Look, it's obvious, right? Because I'm wearing it right here. So it's not one of those sins you can keep secret, right? It's just there. And, and what's really bad is this week, uh, I had my annual physical, so I went to my doctor, and my doctor said, you're fat. <laughs> she did not actually say, you're fat. She used medical terms like obese, and, uh, <laughs> which doesn't make it any better at all. And, and so, and I'm like, yeah, I know I'm fat. I see myself on YouTube and Facebook, and it's painful <laughs> because it's right there, and you can't hide it. And, you know, and on, honestly, this is because of a gluttonous indulgence of ice cream, all right? And I need to repent. And so I'm confessing right now. I'm repenting in front of you. So if you offer me ice cream in the next few months, I'm going to say no, because I need to stop, uh, because I would like my pants to fit and be able to breathe when I tie my shoes. So, and I know that's why some of you wear slip-ons. Uh, so... But see, all of us are tempted to indulge our flesh in destructive habits. 
And you might go, oh, that's not so bad. Well, yeah, it is, because this will kill me if I keep, you know, eating like that. So, uh, by the way, this is why we have Celebrate Recovery on Monday nights at Sweetwater Campus. And if you are trapped in, uh, you know, a cycle of indulgence, then you can't break it. Then this is what Celebrate Recovery is for. So show up. It's also why we offer uh, pastoral counseling at Calvary. We'd be glad to help you out if you are stuck. So how do we prepare for the battle with indulgence? The answer is fasting. Fasting. The spiritual discipline of, of forsaking food for God. You might go, I don't, I don't get the connection. Well, let me just explain something. First of all, I wasn't taught to fast, okay? I grew up in churches where they go, eh, fasting, you don't have to do that. The problem is, Jesus said in Matthew 6, when you fast, he didn't say, if you decide to fast. <laughs> He's like, when you fast, do it this way. And he has like a whole paragraph about how you fast and what you do so that you don't call attention to you being super spiritual or something. And, and by the way, when I talk about fasting, I'm not talking about intermittent fasting so that you can lose weight and you know, all that kind of stuff. Some of you might be recommending that for my ice cream issues. But, uh, but understand, in Jesus' day, people lived hungry all the time. And so for them to forsake a meal or a day's worth of food was a big deal. It was a sacrifice for them. And they were saying, hey, God, this is important to me and I want to fast for you. So fasting is, in one sense, a physical prayer. Okay, it's just a physical form of praying. But it's also preparation for refusing the temptation to indulge. You see, when we fast, we choose to reject God's gift of food for a season. And this is a good gift of food, okay? And, and even though God created us to eat and we need food to live, we choose to abstain for a determined amount of time. And in doing that, we practice self-denial, okay? We're practicing self-denial. We're practicing saying no to the desires of our flesh, even if those desires are good. Do you, do you follow? Now, see, most of us are like, I don't want to fast. I don't want to give up a meal. But can I just encourage you to skip, you know, try this. Skip a meal and, and spend that time praying instead of eating. Or spend that time reading the Bible instead of eating. Yeah, go without food for a day if, if medically you're able to do that. Or just eat something that doesn't taste good. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd recommend Brussels sprouts, but some of you like those. Um, but, uh, you know, you do that because you want not only to just say, hey, God, I, I'm serious about this thing I want to pray about, but I also want to practice self-denial. Jesus said, if anyone's going to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and come follow me. Now, this is not pleasant. This is not wonderful. Some of you are like, I don't want to fast. No, you don't want to fast. That's the whole point. It's a sacrifice that you are giving yourself to God for that time period, and you are practicing rejecting the desires of the flesh, practicing self-control. You see how that works? See, the more fasting becomes a practice in your life, the easier it becomes to defeat the indulgence of the flesh and win that victory inside. So the first common battleground for self-control is indulgence. The second is anger. Anger. By the way, feeling angry isn't a sin. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, the Apostle Paul says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Okay, so it's okay to be angry. That's not a sin. Just being angry, feeling angry. But, um, but destructive anger is a sin. Selfish anger is a sin. Anger that hurts the people that we love is definitely a sin. So most of us struggle to be angry and not sin. It's a battleground for self-control. And by the way, works of the flesh, again, in uh, Galatians 5, are enmity, anger, and dissensions. You know, in other words, us fighting with each other. And, um, and since we're talking about, you know, wisdom and Proverbs and stuff like that as we started this, um, Proverbs, by the way, if you don't know Proverbs, uh, I'd encourage you to read it because it's the book of wisdom that tells you how to live your life and not be an idiot. Okay, I mean, Solomon was trying to train his boys on, on how to be men and how to be wise. And, and so in Proverbs, it warns us about anger at least 37 times. 37 times. Proverbs 15, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs, also Proverbs 15, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. 
Proverbs 14, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Ooh, you like that one? He who has a hasty temper exalts folly. How about this one, Proverbs 22. Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. If you're angry and you don't have friends, Proverbs is telling you why. Just saying, Proverbs 29, a man of wrath stirs up strife and one given to anger causes much transgression. Wow, unrestrained anger is a problem. It leads us to say and do things that are self-destructive and damaging to other people and, and it, it'll kill your relationships. It, you know, it'll destroy your, your, your friendships if you're angry all the time. So how can we have some victory over anger? I think the antidote And what we need to practice is forgiveness. We need to practice forgiveness. See, forgiveness leads us to become less angry. I mean, think about why you get angry. I know, the first answer you're going to say, if I say, why do you get angry, is stupid people, right? (laughs) Right, because that's why we get, because stupid people. There it is. I I get angry because of stupid people. But it's because we don't get what we want. In that moment, we're just being selfish and we want something and we don't get it and so we get angry because the driver doesn't get out of our way, right? Or because they're following too closely or because, you know, uh, you think somebody, you know, owes you something, whether that is respect or compliance or an apology or an agreement and we don't get what we want so we get offended and we get angry because our pride is hurt, Our pride is hurt. And so then we hold on to this bitterness and then we get angrier and angrier and angrier. But forgiveness changes that cycle because forgiveness will cleanse our soul from bitterness. And and forgiveness reminds us that God offers grace to us when we don't deserve it. Right? See, a lot of times, and I've talked to people, like they, they go, well, I'm, my, I'm justified to be angry. And I'm like, so is God. <laughs> right? I mean, God's way more justified than you are about being angry. And he's not angry. He's offered you grace and mercy. So why don't you offer grace and mercy because you're supposed to forgive as you've been forgiven. And if that person has offended you, then why don't you forgive them instead of want to hurt them? I'm just letting that sit for a minute because... That's where we live. You see, if we, if we just can think about, meditate, have the attitude of grace, it, it'll change our temper. It'll change how easily we lose our temper, how angry we get. You see, when we live in an awareness of God's mercy and we practice that active forgiveness, it lengthens our anger fuse. And it makes it possible to be biblical, to be angry and yet not sin. Uh, I, I remember when my, my girls were little and, uh, and I, I grew up in, a, in an angry house, you know, where the temper was lost and the parents got angry and we got disciplined rather harshly at times. And, uh, and I remember uh, my, my oldest daughter, you guys, some of you know her, uh, she's defiant. Uh, she's strong-willed. She was as a child, uh, as an adult too, but uh, that's different. She doesn't answer to me now. And... Uh, <laughs> And I remember she backtalked her mom and she was probably four years old. And I got so angry that it scared me. And I went, why am I angry? I mean, I mean what she did was wrong and she needed to be disciplined. And, 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 I, and I believe in discipline, but I was angry and I went, I don't wanna be that guy. I don't wanna, I don't wanna do what, what happened in my family. I mean, anger was the, the emotion that we showed. And I went, I don't, that's not who I wanna be. That's not the, the father I want to be. I don't want her to be afraid of me because I'm angry, uh, you know, even if she deserves discipline. And, and I recognized that and I went, oh no, I'm gonna repent of this right now. I'm gonna practice this differently. I'm gonna do this differently because that's not who I want to be. And see, you can justify it all you want, but it's still out of bounds. And it's still gonna hurt you and it's still gonna hurt your relationships if you give in to that temptation of anger. God is calling you to self-control. You're gonna get there if you practice forgiveness. 
So the common battlegrounds is self-control, indulgence, and anger, and finally the tongue. The tongue. James 3 describes the tongue as a fire set on fire by hell, a restless evil full of deadly poison. Anyone else want to confess on their tongue right now? Deadly poison? Yeah, you know, restless evil? There you go. Um, by the way, the deeds of the flesh, if you read Galatians 5, include jealousy, division, and strife. Sounds like tongue issues to me. Again, going to Proverbs, this book of wisdom. Uh, Proverbs 10, 19 says, When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Proverbs 16, 28, A dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisperer separates close friends. Proverbs 26, 28, A lying tongue hates its victims, and a flattering mouth works ruin. My personal favorite, Proverbs 12, 18, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Write that one down. Memorize that. Reckless words pierce like a sword. In other words, when our words are reckless, when we're, out, we're not practicing self-control with our words, we are just cutting up the people around us uh, to pieces. We're, we're stabbing our children. We're stabbing our spouses. We're stabbing our friends. You see, we all have words, and that means we have the power to heal or to destroy, to build up or to tear down, to bless or to curse every single time we open our mouths. You know, earlier, uh, you know, I was listening as we were singing and praising God and celebrating, and, and, and I knew that I was going to share this, but James 3 says, with our mouth, with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not to be. So easy, so good, right? We're, we're worshiping together, we're celebrating together, we're praising God together, and we walk out, and what do we do with our mouths? What do we do with our words? How much do we hurt? You see, if we want to win the battle for self-control with the tongue, then what we have to practice is blessing. We need to practice blessing. Now you can use other words there if you want to use words like encouragement or whatever. That's fine. But Romans 12, 14 says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Okay, this is the word of God. Again, circle that one, write it down, put it, place it all over your house. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You want to radically change your life. You want to practice self-control with your tongue. Practice that. You see, to be able to do that means we have to practice, practice, practice blessing people every day, constantly encouraging the people around us. And think about this. If we aren't practiced at blessing our family who we love, if we aren't practiced at blessing our friends whom we enjoy, if we're not practiced at blessing random people that we encounter in, in our daily lives, then we will never be able to bless those who hurt us and attack us and say nasty things about us. Does that make sense? Okay, if we, don't, if we can't bless our family who we love, if we can't bless our friends whom we enjoy, if we can't bless the, the random people who are serving us and helping us along the way, then we're never gonna be able to bless the people who actually hurt us. Which means we're not gonna be able to follow the word of God. We're not gonna be able to practice self-control. We're not gonna be able to do that. That's why we have to practice blessing people every day. And, and so I would just ask you, are you known for your encouraging words that bless or are you known for your destructive words that curse? That's a conversation that you and the Holy Spirit might need to have this week about the words that come out of your mouths because our tongues will betray everything that we believe and proclaim about God's goodness and grace unless we practice blessing. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you're fighting a battle within. It's real and it's ongoing and it's not going to go away as long as you're inhabiting this body of sin. The Holy Spirit, he is teaching you self-control. He's teaching us self-control. So are you ready to practice for the victory or will you just resign yourself to defeat? See, we, we need to take hold of his teaching. We need to be students who are learning. You see, I want to win this battle, and I want you to win this battle as well. 
But I just got to remind you, you will either learn self-control or you will engage in self-destruction. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being patient with us, for loving us, for uh, just continuing to strive with us. You're calling us to follow. You're calling us to obey. And we want to, but we're weak. And you know our weakness. You know the ways that we fail. You know our battlegrounds that we're losing in, in this fight for self-control. So God, we surrender once again. We ask that you would teach us. We ask that, that you would help us to be those students that, that either you know, learn to say no to the indulgence of the flesh or say no to our anger, or say no to the losing control with our tongue and we would honor you with our lives and we would be people who live in your power and your love and your self-control. So we're listening for your voice. Speak to us now, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Self-control is an internal battle, and victory is achieved through preparation. I hope today's message ministered to you, and that you will rely on Jesus for your words, actions, and your life. If you'd like to learn more about Calvary, I invite you to visit us on the web at calvaryaz.com. There, you'll be able to watch and listen to past sermons, follow us on our social media channels, and give to support us financially. Well, that's all for today. Please come back and join us again next week. Bye-bye.